And with that, I'll get into aquatic resources. So again, I'm a freshwater ecologist. I look at all the bugs and fish and things in the streams. I go around through the county um, looking at all the streams and things like that, making sure they're in good health. Um, and so the kind of you know, starting point for the uh, all of our streams is understanding the water cycle. And I know Dan already went over this a little bit, um, so I won't uh, go on too long. Um, but it's important to know uh, the cycle of water and how all of our streams you know, are full of life and all that stuff. So it starts kind of with evaporation. I've kind of put little boxes around all the important terms um, that you might need to know. So evaporation, I'm sure most of you have heard of that, but that's the process of water turning from, um, you know, going from a liquid and turning into a gas and floating up into the sky. Um, condensation is that liquid then condensing into clouds. Um, transpiration is somewhere in between those. So that is actually uh, the process of water traveling through plants and through their leaves and then uh, going up into the atmosphere and condensing into clouds. Um, precipitation is that condensed water in clouds um, condensing even further, so much so that it goes from a gas into a liquid, back into a liquid and then falls um, back to the earth. And then we have infiltration, which Dan talked a little bit about as well, but that is the process of that water then um, going through all those little holes that are in um, the soil um, down into the ground. So recharging our groundwater, going into groundwater storage, um, filling our aquifers, things like that. And the water cycle is always moving. It is always going through this circle. Um, so that's also important to know. <clears throat> And then moving on to why water is so important. Um, you know, every everyone needs water. All plants and animals need water. So it's very important that we conserve um, the fresh water that we have because most of our water, about 97% of our water is locked up in oceans. So it is saline water. It has a lot of salt in it and we can't drink that water um, um, unless we go through a very, very energy intensive process of removing some of that salt. So only about two and a half percent of the world's Earth's water is fresh water. A lot of that is locked up in glaciers and ice caps, so we can't access that either. Um, so the majority of water that we use that we get for our drinking water comes from groundwater. Um, so like digging wells down into the ground to suck water out of them. Um, and that's where we get most of our water. Um, it's surprisingly not from like lakes and ponds and rivers and things like that, but we do get a lot of our water from um, lakes and ponds and a lot of our groundwater eventually flows into our lakes and streams and rivers. So it's important to know that water always returns to the earth, but not always in the same location, quantity or quality. So sometimes that water, while it's moving through the cycle, can pick up various pollutants along the way, whether it's in the soil um, through <clears throat> like nitrogen and phosphates or whether it's picking it up and depositing it atmospherically, um, that can happen as well. So fresh water is a limited resource, um, and with climate change and increasing in the increasing populations, um, it is even more important that we protect and conserve the fresh water that we have. Um, as more pollutants get into our water, um, and we allow more pollutants to get into our water, it makes it more difficult for us to take those pollutants out so that we can safely consume it, not only us, but also the plants and animals around us as well. So um, we break up um, the, you know, where water flows into watersheds. So what is a watershed? A watershed basically is an area of land that drains into a specific location. Um, usually that is a stream, a lake, a river, or a bay. And so we also have these things called watershed divides, and those are the lines that kind of determine which direction water will flow. Water always flows down. And so topography is what really determines what a, or where a watershed is located. So topography is, um, in layman's terms, kind of like the up and down, like hills and, and trenches in terms of like height and, you know, where land actually is. So that's where how we determine where a watershed is. And so protecting our watersheds means not only protecting, you know, the river, you know, the big Potomac River or the big Chesapeake Bay, it's also protecting all of the entire watershed. So all of the water that, you know, flows 
from our streams in Fairfax into the bay is really important, but also all of the other streams that are up north, you know, in Loudoun, all the way up into New York and Pennsylvania. So it's very important that we not only protect the stream or the lake or whatever, wherever we get our water, but the entire watershed and manage um, the pollutants and things that are in there as well. So how big are watersheds? They can be very, very small. It can be, you know, as small as you really want them to be, um, like a puddle size, wherever water blows into a bowl. Um, and they kind of nest within each other, kind of like Russian nesting dolls. So small ones are inside of larger ones, which are inside of even, even larger ones. So we break up the county, or for Fairfax County, so we break up the county into different watersheds. Um, and that helps us to strategically pick streams where we can go, you know, to the bottom of a watershed, take a sample, and that will give us an idea of what is in the water for that entire watershed. Um, and that's kind of why we break it up into different watersheds so we can figure out where different pollutants might be coming from. Um, but also we know exactly where that water came from as well and where it's going to be going. So most of our water goes into the Potomac. Um, some of our water also goes over into like Akatine Creek in those areas down there. So they also so they start small and they can get very, very big. So the Chesapeake Bay watershed is absolutely huge. Um, it covers, you know, a huge chunk of Virginia, most of Maryland, a piece of Delaware, large area of Pennsylvania and even all the way up into New York. So it's a very, very large watershed. And that's also one of the reasons why it's so difficult for us to try to keep it clean. It's not just um, Fairfax and Loudoun, if, even if we do our part to maintain the water going into the bay, it wouldn't mean a lot if Pennsylvania didn't care so much. So it's very important that not only us, but everyone in the watershed is doing our duty to try to keep our water clean. And that's what's really going to help try or, you know, keep the bay clean as well. <clears throat> so I mentioned it a little bit earlier that topography is kind of what, um, makes up a watershed. So what we would do is we'd go to maps with topographic maps. So the lines, the close together lines indicate a steep slope. Um, far apart lines indicate that it is a very you know, non-steep slope, um, uh, less of a degree of angle, and the tops are mountains or hills or things like that are circles. So that's where it is the top of something and it um, goes down in all directions. So we can draw lines around the streams that exist and around the topography of an area to figure out where water will be flowing. And that's how we know where, you know, water will land on a drop of or a drop of water might land somewhere, you know, way up top um, and go into a watershed someplace totally different. So these are the types of maps that we use to delineate watersheds. Um, so another quick thing is um, using the Staller stream order. So the order of streams is pretty much the size of streams. And so um, when two streams of the same order join at a confluence, that is the only time that it will increase in order. So the order is really just the size of a stream. That's how much water is in that stream. Um, <clears throat> And it's important for us to know the difference between headwaters, so things like a level one, which are, are uh, yeah, level, level order one, are much smaller streams. Um, they tend to have fresher water um, and a lot less water in them as well, and different organisms. So two ones that combine at a confluence will become a two, but if another one attaches to that two, it will not change the order. So that's also, so that's important to know. And hopefully that picture on the side can kind of give you a little bit of a better clue um, <clears throat> in terms of ordering uh, a stream. So usually the ones are kind of at the top, twos are in the middle, threes are kind of towards the bottom, and a four or five is going to be very big water, lots of, you know, very high quantity, um, and that will be towards you know, the mouth of a river or river system. So I work for stormwater management. So that is really the process of controlling runoff that means from impervious surfaces. So impervious surfaces are really what creates stormwater runoff. Storm water isn't bad. Storm, everyone needs water, plants need water, we need water. Um, but the runoff created from that stormwater landing on our impervious surfaces is what causes a lot of our issues. So 
the so yeah so stormwater management is the process of controlling that stormwater runoff that comes from impervious surfaces um, that don't allow that water to permeate into the ground so the journey of stormwater um <clears throat> A lot of people think that storm water might um, go to a facility where that water is cleaned out. It picks up a lot of pollutants, so it lands. It lands kind of on these impervious surfaces, our rooftops, our driveways, our parking lots, our highways, um, anything that water cannot penetrate the ground. Um, and along the way, it picks up a lot of nasty stuff, any kind of litter that it's out on the ground, um, but also anything like road salts um, that we put out on the street during the winter time. Um, and various other pollutants, pet waste, fertilizers, things like that, all get picked up with stormwater. Um, so a lot of people think that because it's uh, had a lot of pollutant in it, or it goes down these storm drains um, on the side of our streets, that it goes somewhere to be cleaned out, like a wastewater management facility. And that is not the case in Fairfax, at least not in Fairfax. Um, that water goes directly into our stream. So Dan touched on this a little bit. So it kind of creates a little highway system for stormwater to go from a large area into our small streams very, very quickly. And that causes a lot of issues that will that I will talk about in a moment. Um, and the a big difference is that so if we're at our home and we flush a toilet or we're taking a shower, that water all goes to a management facility where they take out all of the bad things um, nasty stuff and so that the water can be put back into the environment or so that it's safe to drink really. Um, but that is not the case for stormwater. The goal of stormwater management is to really get water off of the streets or out of urban areas as quickly as possible um, to prevent floods. So water that can't soak down into the ground will build up on top and therefore run sideways or just keep filling up. So we've created all of these pipes around the county that are all underground. Water flows down those pipes and directly into our stream. So like a little highway for that storm water that's usually full of pollutants as well. Um, to mitigate some of these problems, we've also created a lot of um, <clears throat> Um, low impact development areas, so kind of like these wet or dry ponds, like a picture at the bottom there. So those are just large facilities, pretty much just large bowls. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen some of these probably near your schools or um, in other developed areas, um, but they're pretty much just large bowls that are built to fill up with stormwater um, so that that water can settle out some of the pollutants in the bottom, some of that settlement sediment and other pollutants, um, but also just hold that water back and slowly release it into our streams. So one of the biggest issues with stormwater is the massive quantity of water that very quickly flows into our streams in, um, instead of slowly infiltrating into the ground and into the soil uh, like Dan was talking about. So here is just a quick picture of some wet and dry ponds, uh, some facilities that the county has built to try to slow down the process of stormwater entering our streams to um, hopefully mitigate a lot of that erosion and prevent some pollutants from getting in there. And they also have a whole bunch of different benefits. So, for example, wet ponds, people also, you know, sometimes have fish in them or expect, you know, to see different um, you know, animals or wildlife, but the primary function of both of these is to um, hold and slowly release stormwater. Um, so real quick, how does land use affect runoff? So a big difference between impervious and pervious surfaces. So on the left side, we have kind of an environment that has a lot of trees, it has a lot of grasses and, and brush, very minimum um man-made things um, and a lot of um pervious surfaces so in that sort of environment most of the water um you know goes is soaked up by those plants a good chunk is turns into shallow infiltration um and then a lot or so probably 50 percent of it it turns into infiltration so it sinks down into the ground it sinks into all those little tiny holes um in the soil and some of it goes deep and, and fills up groundwater and aquifers. Some of it kind of stays shallow, held up in there by all the holes and like, you know, the holes and things that Dan was talking about, created by a lot of those root systems um, by plants and trees. 
and a small amount of that turns into runoff um, where it would enter a stream very quickly. So most of the water in a natural um, ecosystem, most of the water would enter a stream through infiltration or through underground groundwater. On the flip side, in a very um, industrious area or an urbanized area, so on the right side with all the buildings and uh, houses, um, as you can see, only about five to you know ten percent, so fifteen total percent of, of that water, of storm water, the landing in an urban environment, actually is able to penetrate the ground, and fifty-five percent of that generally turns it into runoff. So it's just really to show the huge imbalance of runoff. Um, so a very small amount of runoff in natural um, environments and a huge amount of runoff in impervious um, environments. And that comes along with a lot of other um, bad things, I'll say, that I will talk about in a moment. So this map is kind of just to show the imperviousness of Fairfax County. So we are a very urban county, as you can tell. So all the red dots, all that red area, all of that is impervious surfaces. So some of that's housing, some of that's development areas, some of those are highways, parking lots, anything that is impervious. And as you can see, it is a large um, amount of our surface area is impervious surfaces, which, which is what creates a large issue for a lot of our streams um, and why we have um, our streams are very characteristic of very urbanized environments. Um, I'll show you some pictures of those in a moment. So some of the impacts of increased imperviousness. So this is a um, little graph that kind of shows the how water flows after a storm from land into a stream. So water always flows down and it's always um, flowing. So the um, solid line represents a natural environment, that picture with all the trees and brushes uh, and brush and grasses and things like that. So the water in that environment, again, most of that water infiltrates into the ground. So it very slowly infiltrates into the stream through groundwater or a little bit of runoff. So the peak of a storm in a natural environment is quite small. Um, and it is a little more spread out and it's also delayed. So it takes more time for that water to get into the stream because it's flowing um, and it has to go through so many more barriers, mostly the groundwater and trees and things like that represents a high impervious area. So a huge amount of water. So more water actually flows into our streams um, in impervious areas because it is all collected and very quickly goes into our stream. So two things to know is that the peak is much higher. It happens much faster and it also falls off much faster um, than it does in a natural environment. And it also happens earlier. So that water, again, it kind of is, we kind of create a little highway system for our stormwater to go into our streams. And that's why it peaks so much earlier. Um, so I will talk more about some of those issues in a moment. So some of them, the other in, the impacts of increased imperviousness. So um, higher peak discharges and flooding. So that's that huge pointy peak. Um, in the last graph. So that causes fragmentation of the forest corridor, mostly caused by erosion. So that picture on the right is a heavily eroded stream. Um, and Dan showed a few pictures of streams that were a little less eroded. Um, these are, so this is a picture of one of the worst streams that we um, have seen, but we've seen some, um, multiple, I'd say, that are that bad or worse. Um, but it fractures areas of the environment. So if you imagine if you're a deer or any kind of other animal living out in these woods, you can no longer just walk across that stream. So now you are kind of fragmented away from potential places that you can go. Um, it also increases stream bank erosion. So the huge amount, the volume of water also comes with a huge amount of velocity. So that water is now moving very, very quickly um, and it erodes, it causes more erosion along the bank, but also the bed of a stream. So the sides and the bottom of the stream. And once that erosion starts, it's very difficult for it to stop. So erosion kind of begets more erosion as it erodes down. Now there's less roots and things like that to hold that soil together. There's more exposed soil and that exposed soil is just makes it more easy for that soil to be swept away in later storms. 
um, channel enlargement that is just the growth of a channel through through erosion. So as as the soil is taken away, the stream widens and it also deepens, and that is what causes some of the fragmentation and more erosion. Um, degradation of stream habitat. So erosion it does a few things. One of those things is that it takes away um, a lot it, as the stream deepens. Now there are less opportunities for um, tree roots to be exposed in those streams, creating habitat like that. Um, but also the sediment settles out somewhere. So all that sediment that's taken away upstream here in Fairfax, it ends up down in the Potomac and that sediment then settles out in the bottom as the water slows down. And that can smother a lot of animals that live on the bottom of the stream. So if you are clams or mussels or things like that, a lot of those are starting to disappear from the Chesapeake Bay because they are smothered in sediment. Um, that is one of the issues that we have with protecting the bay is sediment. So that's actually also one of the biggest pollutants that we have entering um, the Potomac River and also the Chesapeake Bay is sediment. Um, it also contributes to the loss of a ripple pool structure. So I will talk a little bit more about geomorphology or how um, streams are shaped um, and one of the continuing patterns that you see over and over is a ripple pool, ripple pool, ripple pool. So a pool is like a deep bowl where water moves more slowly. Sediment kind of um, is more likely to fall out in slower moving water like that. Um, it is also a habitat for um, different kinds of fish, uh, mostly like sport fish, so thick body fish. And then riffles are the areas in between pools where water is moving very quickly. There's more oxygen in those in that water. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later on, but it will it, as they erode, it kind of degrades that ability for that stream to have pools and riffles. And instead they kind of just turn into one long straight um, line. Um, and so a lot of habitat disappears that way. Um, and because a lot of that habitat disappears, a lot of the critters like that I would look at, so fish and insects, disappear from there as, as well because their habitat is no longer there. Um, so there's also increased pollution from runoff. So as we increase the amount of impervious surfaces, we also increase the amount of runoff flowing into our streams, not only causing this erosion, but also carrying a lot of pollution with them, whether that is just litter that's people have left out on, this, on the streets, um, so a more soil from areas of construction, um, fertilizer from you know, farmland or even just from yards, um, soap from car washes, anything like that um, flows into our streams um, and it can increase the amount of pollution and also increases the water temperature. So um, land, especially these impervious surfaces like rooftops and black asphalt are baking in the sun, especially in the summer months. So when water lands on them, it is pretty warm water. Maybe you've looked outside sometimes in the summer and seen rain and you've seen kind of steam floating off of um, the asphalt um, as it's raining down. So that water that is runoff that's, that isn't evaporating is very, very warm. And as it enters our streams, it heats, it increases the temperature of the stream itself. And that itself um, causes a lot of issues as well, which I will talk more about later. So here's just a few pictures, uh, more pictures of that erosion potential of a lot of our streams. So all of these were taken here in Fairfax County. Um, these are some of like the worst of the worst. Um, a lot of them are not this bad, but this is just these are some examples of how bad it can get. Um, and Dan talked a little bit about how much sediment is moving through our streams and falling out into the Potomac and the Chesapeake Bay. And this is just to give a little bit more insight into how much sediment um, is really moving from upstream to downstream. So there's a huge amount of erosion potential, and all this is really caused by impervious surfaces, the amount of runoff um, going into our streams, causing erosion. And just for an, um, you know, a side-by-side -side comparison, um, these are what these streams or similar size streams really should look like, where there's almost the bank and the bottom of the stream is, you know, um, very shallow, not a very big drop, whereas the ones that we have typically there's a lot of erosion um, and channelization of the stream itself. So um, what indicators do we use to figure out whether or not a stream is healthy? So as ecologists, we can't just go to a stream and have the stream tell us whether or not someone is polluting in it or not. We have to look for indicators which are kind of like clues um, 
as to whether or not the stream is healthy. And I'm sure you've probably heard that just because water is clear, it doesn't mean that it's clean. There can be all kinds of things in water that's and it still be clear looking or clean looking, um, but still have a lot of different chemicals or um, different properties that may make would make an environment unhealthy for the animals that live there. So the indicators that we use are biological indicators, so living things so that is the insects, um, and the fish that live in the stream, but we also look at um, plants as well. So the plants that are maybe lining the streams. As well as algae, so or plants that are growing in the water. Uh, we also look at chemicals, so um, what is in the water itself? So we will um, take samples of the water and take it to the lab where they will tell us um, different properties of what is in that water. That's kind of how we find out whether there is fertilizer pollution. So if there's nitrates and phosphates getting into a watershed, that's um, what we will look at chemically and also physically. So that's geomorphology or geo is earth or rock. Morph is change and ology is the study of. So how the study of how the earth changes around rivers or how rivers change the earth around them. So these are all indicators that we look at to help us figure out whether or not, whether not, not just if the water quality is good, but if the overall environment, the health of a stream or an ecosystem or a watershed is um, healthy or in trouble. And so I'll go through some of these in more detail now. So biological indicators, so those are the living things. We use organisms to assess and monitor our environmental conditions. So usually to determine the relative health of an aquatic ecosystem. So various organisms can be used as bio indicators, um, which include benthic macroinvertebrates, which are mostly insects, but that also includes things like um, clams or mussels, um, worms and leeches, uh, crayfish, things like that, as well as fish and algae. So um, the reason we look at these, so, th so these are just some pictures of how we collect these different things. So the top picture is of us electro fishing. So if we go to a stream and we just use a rod to catch a single fish, that single fish is not going to tell us anything about the overall health of a whole stream system. If we just happen to find the one um, sensitive fish in the stream, we would be very easily led astray to think that the water is healthy, even though it's not. So what we have to do is catch all of the fish in a small area of a stream to give us the best sample of, of of fish. So we put a net at the top of an area and then we start at the bottom. We make a line across um, as you see there. Some people have these um, big electric backpacks on and the point of those are electric backpacks. So they send electric current in between an anode and a cathode. It creates electric current. The fish gets stunned kind of like a taser. Um, a lot of them have an organ in their body called a swim bladder, which has a little air bubble in them. And so most of them float to the top when they're stunned and then people with the net scoop them up before they you know, become unstunned and then we put them in a bucket. So there's a person with a bucket back there and once we get up to the net, none of the fish can get past that net. So we're able to catch all the fish in that area. Once we catch them all, we figure out, you know, we go through them all, ID all of them um, and count the number of species and also the number of overall fish that we find. And then we put them back in the stream once we've uh, identified all of them. And that's the best way to get an overall sample of all of the fish living in a stream. Um, and then the picture at the bottom is of someone doing a benthic sample. So that's how we would collect benthic macroinvertebrates. Uh, we would just take a net. A lot of benthic macroinvertebrates like to live in riffles because that's where oxygen is. Fast moving water. Um, is a lot and there's a lot of like bubbles and things like that. That's where air and water are mixing together and adding oxygen to the water along with other um, gases from the atmosphere. So a lot of them like to live in riffles. So we'll go to a riffle. We will put a, a net at the bottom downstream of us, kick the rocks around and those insects get a little scared. They let go of their rock or whatever it is they're holding on to and the water just gently pushes them into the net and that's how we collect the benthic macroinvertebrates. Those um, we end up taking back to a lab. We have to look through all of them um, individually because they're very, very teeny tiny. Um, <clears throat> and those living indicators give us a really good idea of um, how healthy the stream is. So the importance of 
looking at this data or gathering this data is that we have kind of discovered that as imperviousness increases, um, biologic integrity decreases. So the more impervious surfaces we have in an area, the worse off in terms of biologic indicators. So fish and insects or fish and benthic macroinvertebrates are going to have or are going to be in a stream. So the less uh, impervious surfaces, the healthier the stream system, the healthier the water. As we increase imperviousness, the more pollutants are going into our water, the more erosion and more sediment, um, the more degradation of the environment of those streams, loss of habitat, all of those contribute to a decrease in biologic integrity or a loss of species. So benthic macroinvertebrates, the reason we look at benthic macroinvertebrates. So um, if we are going to a stream and all we do is we take a sample of a stream, we take a water sample, we put it into a cup and we take it to the lab. That kind of just gives us a snapshot or an instant picture of what is in that water right then and there. Um, it doesn't tell us if someone pollutes a week later or if someone happened to or if pollution happened to enter the stream a week before. It's it is only what is in that stream that day when we take the sample. So benthic macroinvertebrates are really good um, indicators for us because they are stuck in the stream. They live in the stream for a very long time. Um, and so we are able to determine whether or not a stream is healthy based on what types and how many different uh, macroinvertebrates we find. So they spend most of their lives in the streams. A lot of these go through um, metamorphosis, kind of like a caterpillar into a butterfly, where they start their larval phase in the water where they're sense where they have gills, they're breathing in um, the water, different types of pollutants that happen to be in that water. Um, and if there's a lot of pollutants or different types of pollutants that certain animals are more tolerant or sensitive to, those sensitive insects are going to disappear from that stream. So over time, we can look at a stream and figure out where sensitive species started to disappear from that stream and be able to hopefully figure out what's been causing it. So um, again, as I was saying before, so they have various tolerance to pollution. So um, tolerant, moderately tolerant and sensitive are kind of how we um, organize the different benthics. We put them into those three categories. If we find, so if we go to a stream and we find only tolerant organisms, only organisms in that red category. So that could be things like leeches, lung snails, worms, black flies, things that we know that can handle a lot of pollution and survive. And that's all we find. We know that this is a pretty um, polluted stream and it has been polluted for a long time. On the other hand, if we go to a stream and we find a large variety, so a high biodiversity of insects of these benthic macroinvertebrates, um, including sensitive insects, so things that will die very quickly if there is a lot of pollution in the environment, um, we know that that water is probably is still pretty um, healthy overall because it's able to sustain these sensitive insects that would normally die off if there was a lot of pollution in them. And so here is just some pictures of some of our more sensitive um, benthics that we look at. So at the top there are mayflies or ephemeroptera. Um, that's their, so these are just their order names and then their common names next to them. So mayfly larvae, they're distinguished mostly through, they have three tails. All mayfly have three um, individual tails and that's a dead giveaway that it is a mayfly. So if we find mayflies in a stream, we know that the, the water is of pretty good quality. Um, Stoneflies or Plenicoptera are the next um, sensitive, and then caddisfly larvae are the next. So caddisflies are really interesting because not only are they used as um, indicator species for us, but they also um, build their own little cases. So they spin silk kind of like a spider, and instead of using that silk to catch other insects as prey, they use that silk to take things from their environment and turn them into a shell for themselves, a casing um, that they use not only as a camouflage, but also just protection as well. So they have a hard plate on their head and their abdomen, but the back section is very squishy um, and it doesn't really have any protection. So that's why they build these cases and different species will use different um, 
things, materials from their environment um, to make their cases out of. So the first one is make uses, you know, little pebbles. Um, and then there's another species next to it that will actually find sticks or grass and use their mandibles to cut them into certain lengths and then use those lengths um, to make their case, sometimes in geometric patterns, which is really interesting and not often seen in nature. So it's a very interesting thing to see. So those are the three most sensitive um, orders or um, families of benthic macroinvertebrates that we like to see um, if we find them. And so a lot of these insects also go through metamorphosis. So they live their larval phase in the water. This is an example of a dragonfly larva. And a lot of people don't know that dragonflies actually come from the water. So they go through metamorphosis just like a caterpillar or a butterfly or a caterpillar into a butterfly, I'm sorry. So they live, they spend, you know, sometimes years in the water. And then when they're ready to pupate and turn into a dragonfly, they will crawl out onto a piece of grass or a stick or a cattail or something like that. Their skin hardens around them and they go through metamorphosis in there, transforming into a, a, an adult dragonfly and then they fly away. So we do not look at adult versions of any of these benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, and that's because they could have come from anywhere. A lot of them are winged, they fly around. Um, they could have come from a totally different watershed depending on how far they travel and how far they live. So that's why, and also they're no longer, you know, dependent on the water. The water is no longer, the water quality is no longer um, an indication of the health of an animal that is now terrestrial. So we only look at these animals in their larval phase in the water. And so what we use is to identify a lot of these animals. This is kind of a, um, a simplified version of a dichotomous key to benthic macroinvertebrates. So what you would do is you kind of start at the top where it kind of says no shell or shell. Um, for this example of a dragonfly larva, you'd follow it down to legs or no legs. A dragonfly larva has legs. You would continue to follow it down how many legs, how many tails until you figure out or get to a subsection of animals that meet all those criteria. And from there you can identify what those um, what that uh, specific benthic macroinvertebrate is. So this is kind of a um, a simplified version. What we usually use is a really big textbook that has a lot of a lot of very up close images of different parts of a lot of these animals. And so macroinvertebrate habitat. Um, so I talked a little bit about this. Most of them like cobble or riffles. So we spend a lot of time, or if we go to a river to collect bent or stream to collect benthic macroinvertebrates, we'll often do a lot of cobble or riffle habitat. And that is because there is a lot of, that is where the most oxygen in the water is. So moving water has more oxygen. Um, it's also usually a little bit cooler. And so the insects like to live where there's more oxygen. Also, a lot of them can crawl around in between all the big rocks and, and uh, things like that as um, habitat and kind of as ways to evade predators, things like that. Um, but it's also important to sample a variety of habitats because some insects only live in certain habitats. For example, um, dragonfly larvae often do not want to live in ripples. They want to live in leaf packs or vegetated root banks, much slower moving water. Um, that's where they prefer. So it's important to hit different types of habitats so you're getting the best sample of the overall stream or the area that you're trying to get a sample of. And so these are just a few examples. We have a leaf pack, which is just a pack of, you know, um, dead leaves usually. Um, um, a lot of insects eat um, the decaying debris of leaves and leaf litter and organic matter. And then a lot of them also like to live in vegetated root banks, again, for the same reason, living off the algae, eating the little bits of wood and things that get caught um, in exposed roots. And so we look at benthic macroinvertebrates, um, and we also look at fish. So these are just a few of the native fish um, in Fairfax County. And the reason we catch fish is the same reason that we catch benthic macroinvertebrates, um, because some of them are tolerant to pollution, while others are very sensitive to pollution. If we find a stream full of very tolerant species, we know that the water is probably polluted. It's probably been polluted for a long time. Whereas um, if we find a lot of sensitive pollute or sensitive insect or fish, I'm sorry, Mix up my words. Sensitive fish, we know that the water is probably of a higher quality. 
Um, fish are also a little more mobile so than benthic macroinvertebrates. So if a benthic macroinvertebrate disappears from a stream, it takes a long time for another one to find its way back if the water, even if the water quality improves. Whereas fish, if the water quality is degraded and the fish disappear for a while, the water quality comes back, the fish will eventually come back as well just because they're a little more mobile in the streams. Um, and again, some fish prefer different habitats. So again, it's very important that we have different habitats. So some fish like the top two, the fantail darter and the rosy side dace, dace prefer fast moving water. So they like riffle water really. So fast moving water, whereas other animals like the ones on the bottom, the white sucker and the American eel, they like, uh, they are bottom dwellers and they prefer much um, um, deeper water. That's also much more slow or they don't like fast water very much. So it's important that not only we make preventing a lot of erosion and things upstream that are caused by our stormwater runoff. So how do we identify these fish? Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways. Fish are very complicated, and a lot of them look almost exactly the same when they're all very, very teeny tiny. So this is just one way that we might look at fish to help us determine what species is what. So um, for example, is where their mouth is located on their face. So some feet, some species like the the first example of a terminal mouth. So that is a picture of a small mouth bass. Um, so they are predators, so they will be hunting for food, usually in deep water. So that they're going to be chasing things down. So food that is right in front of them that they can chase down and eat. They are going to have a mouth right in the middle of their body so they can, you know, get or have the most the best chance of getting the food that they want. Um, some fish, like the mosquito fish there in the middle, have a superior style mouth. So that is a mouth that is kind of curved upward. Um, and those are animals or fish that will eat animals that live above them. So maybe they are, um, like in the case of the mosquito fish, they eat mosquito larvae. Mosquito larvae live at the very top of the water um, level. And so they kind of just come up from the bottom and kind of snack on mosquito larvae that are living just at the water's surface. Other animals with us or other fish with a superior mouth style are kind of like a ambush predator. So they'll come up from the bottom and snap things up that are living above them. And then there's the inferior type mouth. And so that is a picture of a white sucker again. So those are fish that kind of live on the bottom. They are eating, um, they're really scavengers. They're scattering algae off of rocks. They're animals that died and fell into the river and sank to the bottom. They're also eating crustaceans and things that just live on the bottom of the stream. So even benthic macroinvertebrates, um, things like that. Um, so based on where the mouth is located on a fish can tell us a lot of information about what it's eating and help us identify the fishes in general. So that's just one of the very many, 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 many indicators that we use to help us figure out what fish we are looking at. Um, so those all those fish that I was showing you before are native species. Um, we have some issues here with non-native or invasive species as well. So I'm sure some of you have probably seen um, pictures here of um, the top picture is a northern, sorry, a bit blank on the name, snakehead. So a northern snakehead. These are fish that came here from parts of Africa and Asia. That's where they're native to. And so they probably got into our environment. They were probably released from an aquarium or we used to actually sell those in a lot of um, grocery stores. So it was actually a food source for a lot of people in Asia. So they probably brought that fish over to continue it eating them. And not knowing that these fish actually have a sort of um, um, kind of like a lung. So they breathe through their mouths and not through gills. So snakeheads can actually crawl on land for short periods, short distances, and breathe air for short periods of time. So they probably let them live out in a pond, not knowing that these fish could actually just crawl away into a stream whenever they really wanted to. And so that's probably how um, so many of them have gotten into our environment. Um, and then the bottom fish is a goldfish. So that is, you know, if people win a goldfish at a fair, pop in balloons with a dart or something like that, um, they get a goldfish, they decide they don't want it, but they also don't want to kill it, so they let it go in the stream. And again, if we have a million people in Fairfax and, you know, a handful of those people let a goldfish into a stream, those goldfish meet up and make baby goldfish, and now we have a lot of goldfish living in our streams. So the issue with non-native or invasive species is that they have no natural predators, so nothing is going to be eating these fish. Um, they create 
more competition for resources. So they're eating the same food that the other native fish might be eating um, with no predators consuming them as food. So they their population increases and now there's more competition for food and they also disrupt the ecosystem. So snakeheads in particular are top predators. So they will not only do they consume benthic macroinvertebrates and things like that in their younger stage, but they also eat all pretty much all of our native species of fish as a food source as well. And with no natural predators of their own, they kind of have spread throughout um, the East Coast really. And so here is a little Dan talked a little bit about uh, the food web of soils, and there is also a food web for the freshwater ecosystems. Um, it kind of starts with the um, organic matter, so decaying leaves and things like that, organics that enter the stream and start to decompose. Um, and then some benthic macroinvertebrates eat, devour those, break those down, turn those into energy, and then are eaten by the larger animals or the fish. So a basic um, food chain would kind of look like a debris for so leaves, which then goes to the insects which eat the debris and then to the fish that would usually eat those insects in turn. And so moving on to stream geomorphology. So we talked a little bit about the uh, biological indicators, the fish and the insects. Um, this is more of the um, shape of a stream so the physical side what things do i will we actually look at in a stream to determine whether or not it's healthy or not so this is just a little picture um, showing um, some of the the basic pattern of a stream as riffle pool riffle pool riffle pool riffle pool over and over and over again um, that is a natural stream we like riffles and we like pools um, you don't need really need to worry about a run or a glide and then the thaw wag is just a term to denote the deepest part of a stream so that will usually go through the middle of a ripple and then to an outside bend where pools are usually located at outside bends um so i already kind of went over pools and ripples so pools um, are important for not only habitat for fish, but it's also where the water kind of slows down. It loses a lot of its kinetic energy and all the sediment or things that might have be filled or might be in that water as it holds that kinetic energy. So once that water slows down, it drops some of those um, suspended things. So like sediments and salts and things like that will settle towards the bottom in those pools. Um, riffles are really important habitat, and that's where also where a lot of dissolved oxygen comes from. So everything, um, so all of our fish and insects need dissolved oxygen, and that's where most of it comes from. And so just one other, there's a whole ton of different um, metrics that we would use to look at geomorphology, um, including riffles and runs or riffles and pools. And another one that we look at pretty um, frequently is called sinuosity. So that is kind of like the curviness or the waviness of a stream. And so how we would um, give a numer numerical value to that is we can walk the length of an actual stream. So as it curves naturally um, over a length and measure that length and then over the exact same distance um, in a straight line, um, we can kind of connect those dots on either side and divide the length of the stream channel. So that's as the stream kind of meanders its own way over and then divide that by the length of the same area in a straight line, and that gives us a sinuosity value. Um, so here are just some quick pictures of what those values might look like. So we have um, a straight stream, which is very close to one or less, so 1.1, so it's almost straight. Um, sinuous has got some turns, um, but not a ton, and that would have a value of 1.1 to 1.5, and then a very curvy stream is anything above 1.5. So. Um, anything that's very curvy, like the picture shown there. Um, and sinuosity is, oops, sorry, um, important for a few reasons. So one, it reduces the velocity of water. So water that's moving in a straight line with a low sinuous value um, is moving very fast. There's nothing getting in its way and preventing it from um, just con or keeping its kinetic energy, um, which can cause erosion. Um, and it also just move, the waters moves through the system much faster. Whereas on the other side, um, a meandering stream that has a lot of curves and bends, that water has not only a lot more distance to travel before it enters the next body of water, um, but it also has all these other obstacles that it's bumping into. So all these different walls and surface area along the stream banks um, that 
that's bumping into and slowing the water down. So those are two important things for sinuosity. Um, another important thing that we look at is floodplain connectivity. So um, as um, so it kind of goes hand in hand with erosion. So um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is the water. Excuse. Um, so floodplain connectivity is really important. Sorry about that. So as water increases, as we get a, as we get flood waters, um, the picture on the left with all the trees and grasses and things like that, the water is very easily going to rise out of the channel and kind of flow into that open flat space next to the stream. And that does a lot of good things because it dissipates energy. It stops that water from moving really, really flat fast and causing more erosion. Um, so it, by doing that, by slowing down the energy, it actually prevents erosion in the stream. And also it cleans out a lot of these sediment and pollutants that might be in a stream by spreading them out over the land. It might make the land look a little more dirtier, like full of sediments and silts and things like that, but it gets that sediment and silt out of the stream. It deposits it on the land and it actually creates a more biodiverse habitat because all of that sand and silt is usually has a lot of other nutrients nutrients in it as well, um, making floodplains um, very biodiverse areas. So areas around streams tend to be much more biodiverse than areas farther away. Whereas a stream on the right does not have floodplain connectivity. So if that area floods, as you can see, there's not a lot of trees there. Um, if that area were to flood, it would um, take a lot more water just for it to break out of the stream channel. Um, so if we go to the same stream, the stream on the left with all the trees and grasses, if we go back there in 10 years, it's probably going to look about the same as it does now. Not very much erosion and still pretty stable habitat. Whereas if we go back to the stream on the right that doesn't have any floodplain connectivity, it's probably going to be much more eroded um, in 10 years from now than it looks right now. So floodplain connectivity is very important. And this hey, Eric, kind of, just wanted to yeah. give you an update that we have just a couple minutes left in our scheduled time. OK, I will move it along. I'll skip that slide then. Um, so we also look at water quality, and that is just kind of um, the things that are in the water itself. Um, so that might be water temperature, for example. Temperature is really important because um, fish like cold water. It also depends on what fish can live there. So some fish need much colder, fresher water than others. Um, canopy and lots of trees shade um, streams so that keeps the water temperature at a much more stable whereas without those trees those sunlight direct sunlight onto a stream can heat up the water very quickly cooler water holds more dissolved oxygen so warm things heat up and they move around more and that releases gases so oxygen leaves um, warmer water faster um, it also affects bi biotic metabolism so it can affect um, the how fish really are so if if the water heats up, fish can get very stressed out, really. They get very stressed out and it can make them sick um, and cause them to die or, you know, just get very sick and move on. And so that also goes hand in hand with our impervious surfaces. So hot runoff from in the summertime from all of our pavement and things like that, um, going straight into our streams can increase the temperature of the water. Uh, we also look at turbidity, which is, again, that is kind of the erosional potential downstream. So all of the, so this kind of picture shows all the sand and silt that has been eroded from the little tiny streams up in Fairfax County um, and that end up down into the Potomac. So this picture was taken a few hours after a storm and that kind of shows all the sediment that's coming from our ups, our little streams upstream and then being deposited downstream. And again, that sediment can cover up habitat and suffocate a lot of animals that live downstream, as well as just being, you know, a fish that now is breathing those things through their gills um, can also make them very sick and agitated as well. Um, so this picture just kind of shows again sediment into a stream. The picture on the left is the erosion upstream, and then the picture on the right shows the um, fallout from all that sediment downstream. Again, smothering all. So there used to be, or there should be, a lot of rocks and pebbles and things like that in a stream like that. However, it's been totally filled by sand and finer silts and sediments. And that can be caused by deforestation as we cut down trees around our streams. Um, the, the roots are no longer there to hold um, the soil intact. So construction as well, we're cutting down the trees, clearing the land, um, 
agricultural operations. So again, cutting down our trees is what's really causing a huge issue for our streams. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just move past this. This is kind of the same thing of um, as sediment kind of falls on top of rocks and things like that, it smothers the potential habitat for benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, I'll move past this one as well. And so I'll talk a little bit about our water quality. So, um, so the most, the t most, uh, sorry, the worst um, nutrients that we see a lot in our streams come from fertilizers. So that is nitrogen and phosphorus, and they can get into our streams from a number of ways. The biggest few are from just straight fertilizers, so that can be people putting it on their lawns so that they grow, you know, nice green grass, and agricultural fertilizers so that we can grow food. A lot of the time we way overdo the amount of fertilizer that we use on our crops or on our yards, and that excess fertilizer that is not used up by the plants is what ends up in our streams. Um, and cause a lot of issues. So the other ways are from raw sewage going into our streams, not picking up after our pets, um, livestock manure, um, things like that. Moving along, so that can also, so that is really what causes, I'm sure a lot of you have seen eutrophication, pictures of dead zones, algae blooms, covering the entire um, surface area of streams or a river or a lake. Um, it is absolutely devastating to the environment. One thing is that they cover the top of a stream or a lake or a pond, and that prevents sunlight from getting to the bottom. Um, it stunts plant growth uh, at the base, which prevents oxygen from getting um, into the water. But also all of those algae, those big blooms, they all tend to die at the same time. What actually is what causes dead zones is the decomposition of all of that algae in the water. It soaks up huge amounts of oxygen, um, the decomposition process. And that is actually what creates a dead um, in a stream or a lake or a pond. So I'll go over point source and non-point source pollution. Point source is pretty obvious. They're just like an obvious place where a sewage drain, for example, enters a stream directly. You can point at it and know that that is exactly where the pollution is coming from. Non-point source is much more difficult to figure out where it's coming from. So that is a large area um, where pollution could be coming from any or all of those places. It's very difficult to stop an entire neighborhood from putting fertilizer on their lawns or just to stop an entire neighborhood from picking up or you know get them to pick up after their pets to prevent um, bacteria from getting into our streams that way. So point source is a little more easier to deal with than non-point source um, pollutions for that reason. Now I'll talk a little bit about riparian buffer zones and then I will end it there. So riparian buffer zones are really um, really, really good. Um, the reason that we like to have them around, so what are they actually? I should say that first. Um, they're the land that is bordering a stream or any other waterway. They are very, they're highly productive and diverse vegetative systems. They can be grass or trees or anything like that. The best ones are forests, so big trees with big roots holding soil together. Um, they um, help flood control. Um, they also help improve water quality by soaking up nutrient or nutrients and also pollutants before they enter the stream. Um, and they also hold back sediment, so preventing erosion. Um, they also slow down water before entering streams. So I talked a little about that. They uptake the uptake of precipitation and runoff. So again, they soak up pollutants and things like that, as well as excess runoff before it even enters our streams. And they help filter water um, before it goes into our streams. So again, they filter out some of those pollutants and sediments as well. So right here in buffer zones are very easy to do. All you really do is let forest or you know natural spaces grow along um, the length of a stream, river, or lake, or pond like that to help protect the waterway in itself. Um, so the plants uptake excess nutrients, the roots stabilize the banks. Um, I already talked a little bit about that, so I'll zoom through some of these. And then lastly, they function as wildlife habitat. Um, they sustain um, dissolved oxygen levels, and they uh, leaves provided carbon food source for aquatic ecosystems. So they pretty much just help protect the environment, um, the habitat, and also the water quality itself. 